you know, how can we resect tumors safely? Um, well, you know, using mapping methods to determine functional and eloquent areas uh, during, uh, you know, that need to be protected during a surgery uh, can be done with a variety of techniques uh, that are listed here, like anatomic MRI, functional MRI, DTIs, motor simulation, sort of awake language mapping. And all of this is required, of course, because functional cortex and subcortical white matter can be located within gliomas, even uh, high grade um, uh, glioblastomas. So, you know, knowing that there's not a reliable sort of visual anatomic way to distinguish between, um, you know, the, the functional parts of the brain and the disease parts of the brain really poses this big challenge of how to, how to remove these tumors safely. So going through these um, each sort of in turn, you know, the most sort of basic ways are to, to deal with anatomy, understanding, you know, where, where is the tumor located to, you know, the sort of uh, normal anatomy of the rest of the brain. And the way we figure this out is with neuro navigation or frameless stereotaxy. This is where in an operating room, we register an MRI to the patient. Uh, this sets up a sort of coordinate system that's read by an infrared camera to help us um, localize exactly, you know, relative to, you know, where on a patient's head or in, in later on in the surgery inside, we are compared to an MRI. Uh, this allows us to incorporate the lesion and sort of known anatomic information when we have it from a basic anatomic MRI, but, um, you know, in and of itself doesn't really tell us anything about function. Uh, there are some limitations with neuronavigation that it's, you know, subject to brain shift. Um, you can use things like intraoperative ultrasound to update information um, when, when it works, um, which is, you know, uh, when a tumor is uh, hyperechoic on an ultrasound and not all low-grade gliomas are. Most high-grade gliomas are though. Uh, Interop MRI can also be used, but um, you know, I think um, this is a little bit controversial. It's also extremely costly and not necessarily available at every center. Um, this uh, is some of our um, studies looking at intraoperative ultrasound and comparing it with MRI. Features help localize the tumor and account for brain shift. Um, which happens when, when you know, the skull is open, uh, cerebral spinal fluid is drained, uh, partial tumor resection is encountered, and you know, the brain can sort of sag down. And if you have that registered to the MRI kind of from the beginning of the case, um, things are not going to end up where they were. Um, so this is trying to, trying to help account for that um, and track sort of a moving, moving object and comparing it to um, uh, the neuronavigation which can kind of show, you know, the extent of, to which uh, these tumors can shift. And especially if you're bordering near uh, eloquent area, you know, if you're just going off of this neuronavigation alone, uh, it could steer you directly into something like primary sensory or primary motor cortex. Uh, so um, that cannot be completely relied on. Beyond anatomy, um, we have uh, functional MRI, uh, which can give us some information about eloquent cortices and their location relative to tumors. Uh, this is a sort of non-invasive mapping um, system that can be used for motor sensory language areas. It works on the principle of neurovascular coupling, which is that increased blood flow um, happens in areas of cortical activation during a task. Uh, it is FDA approved uh, procedure for surgical planning. Um, it is though, unfortunately, more accurate for motor than it is for language and the sort of um, percentage accuracies and retrospective studies are shown there. Um, but we end up using it more for language since we have probably other and maybe more reliable intraoperative means to, to identify um, motor and sensory. Uh, one, sorry, downside to it is that it shows <clears throat> all of the areas of the brain that are activated by a task and it doesn't really determine the effect of a lesion in one of those particular areas. So it tells us, you know, uh, not necessarily what is um, uh, the critical part, but really all potential regions, which is still valuable information. Um, in the majority of people, uh, language is lateralized uh, to the left hemisphere and knowing where these sort of active areas of, of brain cortex are relative to your tumor can help guide um, 
uh, trajectory uh, into a lesion for a resection. Uh, again, just a note about language lateralization. Uh, it's generally left hemisphere dominant in healthy individuals. Um, you know, less than 6% of right-handers, 16% of left-handers have atypical organization. It's actually more common to be um, bilaterally represented in speech than it is to be right dominant alone. Uh, and, you know, um, if, uh, if these critical areas of language um, are removed, other areas of the brain can't just relearn how to speak. And, and so, you know, it's imperative to protect these um, or risk uh, permanent aphasia. Um, you know, language, uh, some other functions, I, I think this was alluded to in other talks, can sort of move um, uh, after an injury um, to other hemisphere can accommodate for, for some injuries. Language is not one that can really do that with the exception of uh, language deficits from the supplementary motor uh, area. Um, uh, but, you know, thankfully, um, many post-surgical deficits can improve with time. Some compensation is there. Speech therapy can help as well. Um, and, and, you know, some of this has to do with uh, how, whether or not the patient is sort of young enough that there um, seems to be a uh, retained ability to reorganize a little bit better, especially in young children. But it's certainly not a perfect type of thing. Um, you know, I think this was touched on before, the sort of different sort of canonical areas of language activation in the brain, uh, these concepts of uh, Broca's area, Wernicke's area, angular gyrus, basal temporal language area, um, show up in sort of reproducible regions of the brain in, in many people, and we can incorporate them into our neural navigation to help us guide, you know, away from resecting them uh, at surgery. A uh, few notes on those different critical areas. You know, one that I don't think comes up all that often is uh, what we term the basal temporal language area. Uh, this is involved in object naming. It's sort of in the low temporal lobe. It's at the sort of lower margin of the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which I'll mention made, uh, later. But, um, you know, lesion here will cause uh, pure anomic aphasia. Um, I think you, we touched on Wernicke's and Broca's before, um, but I think, you know, the important things to, to understand are the sort of differences in the types of presentations that people have in, uh, from those regions. And, you know, this uh, in particular, you know, a Broca's aphasia from a, a Wernicke's type aphasia um, can, can sort of help with your assessment of patients and monitoring them over time and, um, and sort of what to, what to expect and what to expect when um, testing them awake intraoperatively. Uh, I think another critical um, factor in all this is that different languages can be located in different areas of the brain. So bilingual patients uh, need to be tested separately uh, for their different, uh, the different languages which they speak. And shown here is, sort of, is a, a patient bilingual in English and Spanish. And you can see where the English representations are language versus Spanish and I'll sort of toggle between those and you can see the differences um, and how that might come into play in, uh, in a surgery to resect this lesion where you know a different approach might might put the different languages at risk and so knowing uh, knowing that beforehand will certainly impact things on the intraoperative side of what and where to test. Uh, connecting all these areas uh, is an important thing to understand you know the the, the, the brain does not work by isolated cortical islands of activity, but all these areas are interconnected um, by white matter tracks, which can be quite well visualized by this technique of diffusion tensor imaging, which I think you guys have heard about or uh, talked about in some of the other, other talks. But this is, you know, these, this is imaging that we can perform that really allow, uh, allows us to see these tracks by imaging the preferential movement of water along axons in the brain. Uh, this shows us, you know, these subcortical white matter tracks. And uh, what we can do is sort of place a seed or a start point in one area of the brain and see where those axons from that area end up. Uh, and this is useful to locate the white matter tracks involved in motor or speech, starting with the, the seed placed from the activations that we see in a functional MRI. So what does it look like when we put this together where we've got an anatomic MRI showing our lesion, we've got a functional MRI showing the, the language activation surrounding the lesion, 
we incorporate that into our navigation, we can see those activation sites, you know, those cortical activation sites. And then we incorporate the diffusion tensor imaging to interconnect those sites and show us where these critical white matter tracks are um, uh, in relationship to the lesion. And then we can determine a trajectory um, into a lesion or the sort of borders where we're likely to encounter functional uh, brain cortices. Like I said, it's useful to determine trajectory. Um, if we know that the language fibers are displaced anteriorly to a tumor, clearly we're gonna take a posterior approach. It's not necessarily evident just looking at the anatomic MRI alone that those uh, white matter tracks are going to be displaced you know, reliably. So you, know, you need to have that uh, separate imaging to understand you know, which way to approach many of these lesions. There is um, good level evidence to support the use of diffusion tensor imaging to preserve cortical spinal tract function. So okay, this is motor, motor function. Um, this is given to us from uh, this study um, from uh, Wu et al. in, uh, in uh, China. They randomized um, about 240 patients to one group getting neuronavigation where they incorporated the DTIs and another group where they just had standard neuronavigation. Um, there was a uh, trend for improved rates of resection, uh, Karnowski status postoperatively, and actually overall survival in these patients, which I think to, to me was surprising, and I think, but I think it goes back to that same concept that you have to remove the tumor and preserve the neurologic function for the most benefit for these patients. So what happens when the imaging shows that neurologic function is really going to be intertwined or at least extremely close to a tumor? Well, in those instances, we've got to do interoperative functional mapping um, uh, to identify those locations and preserve them at surgery. Um, ideally, this works best when we can have some kind of real-time mapping, not one that's subject to brain shift and all those other problems that we mentioned before. So uh, this type of mapping can be done on both cortical and subcortical structures using uh, direct electrical simulation. This can be done with either a monopolar or bipolar probe like is shown here, where basically you know, two electrodes are applied to the brain, current passes between them, and that current inactivates or activates a portion of the brain depending on its kind of setting. Um, uh, you know, for cortical simulation, we typically low frequency, uh, low amplitude <clears throat> uh, currents are applied, and subcortical can, can sometimes require a little bit higher current to elicit a response. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.